Well, good morning and a warm welcome to today's... Uh, I don't really know what to call these kind of videos where I'm just filming while driving. I know it sounds pretty dangerous, but I don't find it a higher risk than just having a passenger in the seat <coughs> and uh, just chatting to them. You know, I don't look at the camera the whole time. I'm a pretty good and safe driver. And uh, most of my drive to work is just on a straight uh, highway, which is really lucky. And interestingly enough, I just found out that um, the time of commute to work is a major, uh, has a correlation to people's state of happiness. So it's pretty interesting that, um, that you know, living in Sydney, it would take 40 minutes to an hour to, tra to, to go to work, and it wasn't even that far away. But in, you know, where I live at the moment, it, it takes takes 20 minutes and I travel twice the distance but it's just smooth driving there's just way less traffic here so it's um it's very nice uh and it gives me the opportunity to try this new style of video out but uh today I wanted to talk a little bit about therapy and a dilemma that I've been kind of struggling with when I'm talking and with patients and doing supportive psychotherapy um which is really the balance between acceptance versus drive for change. So, you know, if you know a bit about therapy, if you've done therapy or if you've studied it, if you're a clinician or a patient or both, um, you know, it, this, with, this, there's, there's kind of two parallel developments in, in psychotherapy. There's the psychologists, which started off with behavioralism, with Skinner and Pavlov, and it was, you know, reward and punishment and um, uh, and that kind of thing. And then it eventually developed into the cognitive and the CBT and the DBT, uh, domains where they realized that how you think influences what you do and how you feel. Um, and, uh, and so the two kind of therapies that I'm talking about at the moment is CBT versus ACT. So cognitive behavioral therapy versus acceptance commitment therapy. So that was one area of development in psychotherapy. And the other area of development was really the psychiatric psychotherapy which was with started with Freudian psychoanalysis and evolved from that into psychodynamic psychotherapy you know learning le learning about childhood exploring attachments with your psychotherapist and and um and now they've kind of merged together and it's not really there's no real rules as to what kind of psychotherapy a psychologist should do versus a psychiatrist um, the distinction isn't in the types of psychotherapy. Both could do schema, both could do DBT, both could do CBT. Um, it's all good. It does tend to be, though, that a psychologist tends to do more CBT, DBT, uh, and psychiatrists tend to do more psychodynamic psychotherapy and psychoanalysis for those who still do it. Um, yeah, it's still being done. Yeah. And uh, I guess I've always wondered in the psychotherapy world, you know, the balance between acceptance versus drive for change, because it's very tricky in anxiety, especially in anxiety disorders, when you are to um, accept your anxiety, tolerate it, be kind to yourself. You know, for example, taking a day off work. Uh, if you're having a really bad mental health day and you're tense and unwell and you need kind of some space, uh, it's okay to take a day off work. Um, and that, that, that is considered acceptance. You know, you're accepting your, your, your anxiety and you're, you're, you're adjusting your behavior to, to be kind to yourself to get better. Um, and maybe you need to take two days off work or maybe three or four or five or six. And so now once you start taking weeks off of work, well, obviously there's a point where you don't want to just accept. You can't just accept to stop working because of an anxiety disorder. So there's a point in which you have to not accept. <laughs> like you can't just accept everything, right? And that I've never really understood how to explain that to patients. Um, but I was speaking to a psychologist yesterday about it and uh, she had a really good way of thinking about it, which is really around um, being values-based, you know, thinking about what kind of person do you want to be in terms of values, not in terms of goals. Because if you think in terms of goals, you are not being in the here and now. You're not being present. You're saying, you know, I want to be a successful psychiatrist. I need to do this, this, and this. That's not the way to think about um, 
that's not the way to think about this. Whereas if you think about, I just want to be a kind person who can be attentive and present in conversation. I'm obviously projecting my own goals here. <laughs> um, then that is the way to think about it. And, it. and it does work with acceptance and commitment therapy. And so the way that she described, uh, you know, to, to think about things is you, you should, you know, accept your mental illness. Let's just talk about anxiety because it's the one that's most relevant for acceptance commitment therapy, I think. You should accept your anxiety um, to the point where it's helpful for you hitting your values. So obviously taking a day off of work, if you're feeling extremely anxious, might be very important so that you can create the space to get better and explore what's, what, what happened and, and what to do about it. Um, so you accept your anxiety and you, you, know, you do a, the behavior to, to help yourself. That's, that's good. But taking a week off of work and spending that week in bed and things getting worse, because that's what will happen if you spend a week in bed with an anxiety disorder. Things get worse and worse. You get more and more anxious. You ruminate, you decondition, you, you, there's neglect that can happen with some people. So doing, you know, staying in bed for longer, um, well, then that's not consistent with your values, depending on what they are, but usually it's not consistent with your values. And so you have to always be checking your behaviors, which, you know, is exhausting. You know, it's, anxiety just sucks because it's a constant state of, um, well, obviously the anxiety is a constant state of tension and then having to always check if what you're doing is helpful versus unhelpful can be anxiety provoking. Is this an unhelpful behavior? You know, that, that can be a source for ruminations. So difficult. Uh, balance to hit but you know that's why you have a psychotherapist and that's why everyone with you know a moderate to severe anxiety disorder should have a psychotherapist um to to debrief on on what behaviors are helpful versus not it's been interesting for me actually i mean i i technically um you know i don't think i have currently an anxiety disorder it's totally possible i will one day and i always say to myself when i'm treating a patient to humanize them that this could happen to me you know, I could totally develop schizophrenia. It's not unheard of that someone develops schizophrenia late in life. It's less common. It's called, actually, people usually call it a paraphrenia because it happens later in life, as opposed to the old term hebephrenia, which happens earlier in life. Um, but those are kind of historic terms that aren't used that commonly anymore. But it could still happen to me. So I could, you know, um, you know one day I definitely could get diagnosed with anxiety disorder. And, man, I am naive, you know, I have not had significant trauma in my life or significant loss. I've never had someone that close to me pass away. So, uh, and <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to grieve. I don't think, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, yeah, I don't think I would do very well at all. But um, I have good supports at least. But anyway, the reason I was talking about my own um, anxiety is because um, I've been, you know, my partner has been traveling for work and uh, you get a bit more space to think and, and a bit more time and, and you have to decide how to fill your time. And that's quite anxiety provoking because uh, I really, at, at the moment, I'm going through a period of really missing my friends. They're all, all a lot of my close friends are overseas uh, and, and I really miss them. Um, and I struggle to make new close friends because I have so many, I think, because I have so many close old friends from you know, since I was three years old and, uh, and we just have such deep, almost unconditional love friendships because it's so long standing, um, that maybe that creates a barrier for me investing into new friendships. But a lot of my friends are in different cities or in different countries, which, um, anyway, it's just that I've been a bit lonely this week, but being lonely is good. Makes you kind of, it brings up issues up to the surface that you have to confront. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, it's been easy because I've got a clear life goal, which is I'm studying for a psychiatry exam. I've got to pass this psychiatry exam so I can fill my time with this clean goal. And, you know, what happens after I pass the psychiatry exam? You know, what is it? Well, technically I've got another exam after that one. So I've got exams for five years, so I'm all right. But I, I think, um, I'm... I wouldn't call it catastrophizing. I'm reflecting on 
what is life going to be like once I've kind of hit all my professional goals? Uh, and it's a good bloody question. I think that's where kids are very valuable because then they make a very easy thing to focus on. They're very, that's, that's a very easy life purpose to have kids. Um, easy in the sense that, you know, I'm not trying to cheapen it. It's obviously it's such a noble, wonderful thing and I, and I want kids to do it, but it's also a very uh, easy thing to put your, um, to put your anxiety in life Futility. Okay, let me reword this. Having kids is good because life, in my view, is ultimately objectively meaningless and you have to attribute, you have to create its meaning. You have to generate the meaning of life for yourself. And having kids is a very good way to do that and, and clean and easy and straightforward so that you have a clear purpose, which is to raise wonderful people to contribute to, the, you know, to, this, to this world positively. Yeah, that's how I think about kids. But I do, um, you know, I do think there's a lot to be said for good quality friendships. And I do think having an open and loving friendship is a very effective form of psychotherapy. And I actually asked a psychiatrist once, I said, if you had a billion dollars to invest into you know, the mental health system of Australia or whatever country, what would you invest it in? And, and their wonderful answer was so good, was actually he wouldn't invest it into clinicians or therapists or psychologists, but rather into, wait for it, sports coaches <laughs> or, you know, other forms of coaches. And there's a lot to be said for the, let's just call it supportive therapy that occurs between teammates and between them and their coaches. You know, it's, there's that mentorship is incredibly valuable. And I do think, you know, I, I wasn't a big team sports player when I was, um, uh, a kid, I guess, you know, I, I played rugby for a year or two. And that's, I played soccer as well as when I was younger. But other than that, I didn't actually do group sports. But I, I envy those who did because it is such a wonderful community. Um, and, uh, and the mentorship, if you're having a bad day, you can debrief. You can have an outlet through the exercise. Uh, and, and you have a clean goal. You know, your goal is to get this ball into that hoop or or soccer net or whatever it is you're doing so that's that's nice I think I used to have this narcissism about me around thinking that sports are too simple to to want to do you know oh I mean how silly is it to just want to get a ball past a net um that's you know I'm I'm above that now I never said that out loud or felt that out loud but I'm thinking that that was my unconscious process um but I you know I've fortunately grown out of that uh mindset and realize that if you want a large group of people to cooperate, you need simple rules <laughs> that they can all agree to. So that's why sports are, are relatively simple um, in, well, you know, relatively simple in their rule set. Obviously, they're incredibly technical in strategy and, and in, um, you know, becoming as an expert level in them, you need to be you know, quite technically proficient in the strategy. But uh, ultimately, it's a simple, you know, a simple goal which is to get a whatever it is the sport you know to get a, a ball in a hoop yeah so i'm glad i don't feel like that with sports anymore and uh and i think sports are a really important part of you know mental health and kids development and the camaraderie between between the kids that's all really really good anyway i'm not quite sure how we got into sports from acceptance and cbt therapy <laughs> um and, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about with therapy, but I thought I would just talk a bit about uh, that interesting distinction between helpful and unhelpful behaviors and how to accept them. Um, and I don't know, I, I like this kind of video because it's just, it's chilled, it's relaxed. I can just chit chat. And I love the comments that they, these videos are generating because it makes a really interesting um, dialogue with you guys. And I, and I read, you know, 
99% of comments I think I read. Uh, I can't comment reply. I can't comment replies to all of them. Sorry, um, just because I'm studying for exams, so I've got to focus. And it's very easy to not focus with all these really interesting reflections people are having. But uh, it'd be cool to hear from you guys if you've done um, acceptance commitment therapy (ACT) or or CBT, and how you guys balance what is uh, helpful versus an unhelpful behaviour. So how do you kind of make that um, distinguish the distinction for yourself? I mean, I know it relates to values. Um, but how do you guys do it? Another really interesting thing to comment or reflect on would be how do you guys discover your values? You know, it's, it's easier said than done, you know, but if you guys have any tips on how to describe your own values, I mean, what are my values? I think my values are, well, I think my goal, your values and goals are different things. So my values are to be, um, uh, kind, firm. Sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes you got to be firm, kind, but firm. Uh, that's, those are my values as a psychiatrist. Um, I want to give people world-class care. Like I really want people to get the best quality care, not only psychiatrically, but medically. So if I have someone, often people with mental health illness have really bad, you know, medical issues and have been suboptimally managed. So I want to give them world-class care. Um, but I also want to balance that with the good enough is good enough mantra, which is don't over optimize to the point of making things worse. You know, good enough is good enough. Yeah. Those are my values. How did I come to them? I guess trial and error. And I think observation, I think practicing and seeing doctors of different styles and calibers and seeing what I like and what I don't like and, um, the different strategies. That's how I've kind of come to my own place mm -hmm. all right i think that's good for this video yeah uh keen to hear what your values are guys i'm gonna go, i'm gonna start my job i've got to go to work now so i'll see you all in the next video all right bye for now